Thanks, Janet. Thanks. Um, and our final uh, presenter for this afternoon is uh, Professor Surya Deva via Skype. Surya, the floor is yours. Good to see you. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, okay very good. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, it's good to see all of you via the latest technology. I'm going to talk about, uh, in the brief time that I have, about the, uh, the issue about the liability of the parent company. And I think that issue was already being discussed uh, well, to speak of the time. So I'm going to focus in particular on the recent uh, Court of Appeal judgment in the Chandler case. And uh, I will assess that to what extent this is the right approach or should we go further this approach. Let me start uh, by making uh, the background a little bit, that whenever we talk about profit maximization, uh, this sort of facilitates or promotes companies to outsource risk or externalize risk. And outsourcing happens when companies uh, use, for instance, suppliers. So this is very common. And when we talk about uh, externalizing risk, that is done in many cases through subsidiaries. So I'm going to focus on one aspect of it, not outsourcing, which is done by suppliers, but I think similar issues do arise in that context as well. But I'm going to focus only on the uh, subsidiary aspect. Now, if we look at uh, the current principles of uh, corporate law, twin principles, uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with those principles, uh, the first one is the separate uh, personality of the uh, companies, whether the subsidiary or the parent, and the second that flows from it is the limited liability. Now, these uh, two principles are sort of very much entrenched in the corporate law, in both civil law and common law jurisdictions. Uh, there are certain exceptions, of course, but in many cases, uh, these uh, main principles still hold very true. And uh, very recently, I was at this forum on business and human rights, and I would like to bring in back what was mentioned there uh, by the uh, one of the, um, I think it was Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers. So it's a very uh, influential body of companies operating all over the world. And a specific point was made by that person that uh, why should we sue the parent company? Because parent company is a different entity and that's why we should not go after the parent. And if uh, wrong is done by the subsidiary, we should just go and uh, seek the remedy against the subsidiary company. I think in this context, it is necessary to consider very briefly why do we need to sue parent company in certain situations. Uh, first of all, there could be some economic reasons. Uh, the economic reasons could be that the subsidiary is underfunded. It does not have the resources, especially the mass tort cases. Those issues will come. Or there could be a situation that you go for the deeper pockets. There could be incentives for plaintiffs to, to sue companies, the parent company in particular, in those jurisdictions where the compensation could be more. Then if you look at uh, the, the, how the interrelationship is there between the parent and subsidiary, there are governance issues. So to an outsider, it might be difficult to find out uh, where the wrong lies. Is it the decision taken by the subsidiary or the parent company? And that's why there is always this temptation to go after the parent company. Then uh, I think uh, in, in terms of fault, as well as uh, ethical norms, it, it makes sense. If the decisions have been taken by the parent company, it makes sense to make the parent company accountable rather than merely going after the subsidiary company in that particular sense. And finally, from the policy point of view, uh, I think it would be useful if uh, we could make uh, the parent company accountable because that is going to send some incentives, incentives and they should manage their affairs better in that particular context. Now, traditionally, there are several principles that are invoked uh, to hold the parent company liable. It could be the agency principle, it could be the vicarious liability, it could be the situations of uh, invoking enterprise theory. But most uh, common is the veil piercing jurisprudence. However, in practice, uh, piercing the veil has been very difficult. And it has been more difficult. Uh, there have been some research done uh, empirically on this issue. It has been more difficult in 
tort cases as compared to court law cases or tax evasion cases. So when it comes to uh, issues that we are dealing with, environmental pollution or mitigation of uh, climate change and all these issues, veil piercing becomes more difficult. And that will hold also, in my view, in human rights cases. Uh, but it's, it's not really that, because uh, even the courts have been very inconsistent in applying veil piercing. And that's why it is difficult for lawyers to advise the clients whether they can get uh, uh, veil pierced or not. So it is it is really very half-edged, inconsistent judicial uh, approach so far. And I think it is also inefficient because whenever this argument of veil piercing is made, it might take years. So every time we are litigating and the facts of every case are different, and that's why this is also sort of very inefficient. So in my view, we need to look beyond this. So against this background, we can look at uh, the Chandler judgment, the Court of Appeal judgment, uh, and very briefly the facts of this case. Uh, CAPE uh, is sort of a very well-known company because there are many cases involving CAPE, but in this more recent case, it's about asbestos business of uh, CAPE subsidiary, CAPE products. And this uh, person, the plaintiff, Mr. Chandler, who worked with uh, the subsidiary uh, for a short period of time, about uh, 16 to 18 months, I believe, uh, and long time ago, it was 1960s that he worked. And because he was exposed to asbestos, then he suffered from this illness. And because the subsidiary is no longer there, so the case was filed against the parent company, that is KPLC. So the key issue in this case was that whether uh, the direct duty of care can be implied in this case and the parent company CAPE could be accountable and they should have a duty of care towards this uh, person, Mr. Chandler, who was working in this particular case. Now, the court basically applied uh, the three-limb Caparo test, which uh, just to recapsulate very quickly, uh, whether first the first limb is that whether the injury is uh, or the damage is foreseeable the second is whether there is a proximity between the two parties, and finally, the just, fair, and reasonable approach. And applying these Caparo tests, uh, the court concluded in this particular case that uh, direct duty of care can be imposed on CAPE PLC in this particular case. And the court looked at uh, certain factors, like there was one, of one or two directors which were common. Uh, the minutes of the board indicate that there was some control exercised by the company. And more critically, I think there was uh, a group medical officer who looked after the health issues and safety issues for the whole CAPE group. So in view of these factors, basically the court found that uh, direct duty of care could be uh, found in this particular case. I think it may be useful to refer briefly to the test because I think uh, the, the, the critical uh, significance of this case lies in the uh, four-pronged test laid down by the Court of Appeal in Chandler case, and I'm referring to paragraph 80 of this judgment. Uh, the first uh, condition, and the court is saying that if these four conditions are satisfied, then uh, the direct duty of care can be implied. The first one is that the business of the parent and the subsidiary should be the same. The second is that the parent has or ought to have superior knowledge about the health or safety of that particular enterprise in the particular industry. The third condition is that the subsidiary system of work is unsafe as the parent company knew or ought to have known about this particular thing. And the final and fourth condition is that the parent should have uh, foreseen that the employees are going to rely upon it. So these are the four uh, limbs, of the test that the courts have proposed. Now the significance of uh, the judgment lies that uh, from the victim's point of view, it is not necessary anymore to pierce the corporate veil. And the court very clearly differentiated that we are not piercing the corporate veil. We recognize that CAPE products were a separate company and CAPE is a separate company. But in terms of the outcome, uh, basically, there is no difference because you are able to reach the parent company, and that's why uh, I'm calling it gender bypass because you're bypassing the the complexity, complexity, and the difficulty of piercing the corporate will in this particular situation. In the context of Europe, uh, the issue of FNC forum non-convenience is not relevant anymore, but this judgment will have significant implication outside Europe 
because FNC will become irrelevant. If there is a direct duty of care on the home state where the company is based, then FNC, let us say the courts in uh, Australia or elsewhere in Canada, US or in India, Singapore, other countries they apply this approach and FNC is going to become almost useless. So these are significant advantages of this uh, general approach. At the same time, in my view, there are limitations. For instance, uh, this action was based on negligence. Now, in many cases, negligence or nuisance could be a robust remedy to deal with cases of human rights violations of environmental pollution, but they might not su be sufficient in all cases, and that's why that has to be understood. Also, if you look at uh, the four conditions, the court is uh, mentioning that the relevant business should be the same. Does it mean that in a given case in the future, if the subsidiary and the parent company are having different kinds of business, which is not uh, improbable, then will the test not apply? The second limb of the test is superior knowledge. But sometimes the superior knowledge may not be there. And then again, the implication might be that the test will not apply. So I think in my view, Chandler represents a very significant uh, positive development as far as the plaintiffs or the victims are concerned when it comes to violation of human rights or environmental pollution. At the same time, we should not overestimate the usefulness of this test. And there's already some critique of this test that the court is very amorphous about it. And will it apply, for instance, to the cases dealing with creditors and all this, or will it be limited to safety issues and all this? So there are already uh, critique on, on those particular lines. So my, my proposition is, and I will conclude with that, that it may be useful for the corporate law uh, to lay down within the statutory provisions, uh, whichever jurisdiction we're talking about, a statutory presumption. And the presumption should be that the parent company should be liable for human rights violations or environmental pollution caused by its subsidiaries in the entire group, wherever they are operating. Unless the parent company can show that uh, it did not know or it ought not to have known about that particular situation. Or the alternative could be that it knew about it and it took due diligence measures. And despite taking those due diligence measures, violations took place. So unless the parent company is able to satisfy this presumption or reverse the presumption, let me put it like this, parent company should be held accountable. Now, we are not saying that the parent and subsidiary become one for all purposes. What we are saying is that in this particular context, this presumption is raised and the parent company can always displace it by, by providing the evidence. Uh, and similar to similar to situation of uh, vicarious liability, it should also be possible for the parent company to recover the compensation, part of it, from the subsidiary. So the principle of attribution could, could, could come into picture and the parent company can always recover part of this compensation which it might have to pay to the victims from the subsidiary. But that is internal. Why should victims suffer and litigate for 10 years and 6 years and spend so much money? It is internal business of the corporate group. The parent company must pay the victims. And I think uh, because the uh, several states in future the, are likely to draw their nation action plans to implement the guiding principles. So I think we could plug this issue of corporate reform in that particular context. So we could encourage states to consider this question and uh, make this presumption statutorily in their respective corporate laws. And I think this will be consistent with the very idea of uh, corporate groups because we cannot let companies have both ways. Either Parent and subsidiary are different entities. And if they are different, then they should be different both in terms of liability as well in terms of benefits. We should not let uh, the group accumulate all the profits and say, oh, we are such a large group. On the other hand, if they would like to be treated as one group, then they should also be for the purpose of human rights violations and the pollution of environment and all these matters. Uh, so perhaps uh, I will stop here. And uh, if there are any further questions or any comments, I'll be happy to take those. Thank you very much for your...